Welcome to the studio where sometimes we have technical glitches and some challenges, but eventually we will get things running. So the reason that you're here with me tonight is to get a better understanding of the fine art of cropping. Um, I hope we have now got that all sorted. Everyone is here. Video is very hinky though. Video is not good, not clear. That's not great to hear, um, but we are getting through there. And um, so what I'm going to do is I am going to just go ahead and dive into the presentation and kind of run through it. We are making a recording of this for you guys. And so everyone who's here, you'll get a link once it goes up onto our YouTube channel in the coming days. And uh, hopefully if the streaming quality is not as good as it should be whilst you're watching now, hopefully we'll be able to resolve that. So let's get into it without further ado. Let's get into the presentation for this evening. As you already kind of got the idea, today's prezo is all about the fine art of cropping. And so we're going to be looking at a number of um, concepts around cropping. It's a very important and very powerful tool that we can use. And um, I think for a lot of people, it's probably misunderstood in terms of how they use it and how they go about using it for their photography. So we're going to look at using aspect ratios to enhance one's story, cropping for ideal compositions, the concept of eye mapping, which is something that I, anyone who's done um, private tuition with me will know that this is a big thing for me. Eye mapping is very important when it comes to um, creating interesting, compelling images online. And then how to deal with potentially distracting elements within a frame. Finally, I'm going to kind of leave you with this little mantra, crop, check, map, and repeat. Hopefully that'll all make sense in a little bit. So before I go there, I want to just kind of stop for a second and say, and ask you guys the question, when is the best time to crop? And I think this quote pretty much sums it up as best as one can. There is no better time to crop a bad composition than just before you press the shutter release. Again, for those of you who've joined me on Safari, you'll know that I always say that editing starts here. And that is the biggest challenge, is to try and get it right in camera. So whilst we go through this presentation, please keep in mind that it's not simply a case of shooting an image and then cropping in after the fact. You've always got to shoot with that story and with that ideal composition in mind. Now, if you're photographing with a 400 mm lens and you can't get any closer, you're left with no other options but to crop after the fact. But the, the fact remains, you still got to try and get as close to that ideal composition as possible in camera. So, which comes first, cropping or editing? Um, and this is an interesting one, but I think most of us can agree that the most important part here is actually got to do with the histogram. So when we're starting to talk about why it's important to crop first versus editing first. Cropping actually has an impact on your histogram. So have a look at this image, beautiful scene from the Okavango Delta, incredible place. Have a look at the histogram and you'll see that we've got some areas on the right hand side there, those blues in the sky in the top. But if we were to take a crop of this image, look at how quickly that histogram changes and you'll see that everything has shifted over to the left. Obviously, we've taken out the brightest parts of that histogram by cropping out the sky. So not only is it important to start from a crop from a storytelling perspective, but if you are basing your tonal ranges in an image and your edits and white and black points based on the histogram, if you still have areas that you're only going to crop out later and you've corrected those white and black points up front, you probably are going to find yourself in a bit of trouble once you get down to the real editing side of things. So the first point that I want to cover is using aspect ratios to enhance one's story. And this is a very, very powerful technique. And um, cropping can and should work with and not against your story. So assuming that you've got a story, remember that editing starts here with the trigger finger. We're going to look at a couple of ratios and cropping examples. So this is a cool image, a leopard descending down a tree, beautiful patterns and texture in the bark. But actually, you know, the full image itself was far more interesting and far more intriguing. Um, I shot this in portrait orientation to try and kind of sh give a sense of movement, but also because I wanted to maximize the kind of pattern and texture that was coming through. 
Now look at how this image changes as we go through different crops and different aspect ratios. The next one and the final one. And what I really want to point out here is two things. The first, in the original ratio, there are a couple of things that are potentially distracting elements um, within the frame. Up in that top left-hand corner, we've got a window of leaves and kind of sky. Down in the bottom left, there's a bit of green. And when we get to eye mapping, we're going to touch on that a little bit. But just looking at these three ratios, can you see that by removing these two spots um, from the original frame, keeping a very similar kind of composition throughout the next two, but very different stories. The third frame, the 16 by 9 ratio for me, is the one that is most interesting. And the reason that I say that is that you can see that it actually emphasizes the height and it gives you a sense of scale. And that's something that's very important. So when you are cropping, the ratio that you choose is actually very important in helping you to kind of tell your story a little bit better. 16 by 9, as we've said, can emphasize the height, but also width. So typically, if you're wanting to fill a TV screen or a computer screen, 16 by 9 is a great ratio because that is the ratio that those screens are built for. And these are some classic examples of just emphasizing the space a sense of space, great composition, using the rule of thirds, placing the subject on the PowerPoint, giving the subject space to look into on the right-hand side, and emphasizing the width there. If we'd gone with the original ratio, we would have a lot more information towards the top or to the bottom of the frame. And as you can see here, with that beautiful clean background, it's not going to add to the image at all. Here's another one. This is one of my favorite shots from Amboseli of all places. Can you believe an image like this out of the Amboseli? I mean, lion sightings are not really there. The reason you go to Amboseli is for elephants. But for me, this image just, it's an incredible sense of scale and space. And Marlon and I are going to be chatting about animals in their environment um, on Friday. And this is a classic example of how contrast and composition, where there's a subject which is relatively small in the frame, can really still be um, anchoring the, the shot quite nicely. Um, you can see here the width of the scene has been emphasized through that ratio of 16 by 9. And another example here, again, the contrast of this clip springer up on the top, but using a full ratio of 16 by 9 to emphasize the width. We've got these mountains that run from left to right across the frame. And by going with a 16 by 9, we're emphasizing that and not allowing the sky, where we would have a lot more information above the top of the frame, to dominate this scene. So vertical crops to enhance the, the feeling of height and movement from top to bottom of a frame. So I'm just going to hide this so that's out of the way and you can see three classic examples here on the first example the elephant reaching up um, a square crop would have boxed that subject in and wouldn't emphasize the height and um, the second image with this leopard the question that you should be asking yourself when you look at the second image is oh my word how steep and how big is this bank or this wall of uh, earth that this leopard has found itself against and it doesn't matter if the top of that bank was literally just at the top of that frame or whether there was a whole lot more to it. When you look at the image, the sense that you get is that this bank extends forever. And similarly, with the third image of this lion walking towards us, the sense of scale and the sense of place that one gets with these beautiful big trees running in the background. And here, in this instance, you've got the king of beasts literally dwarfed by the environment there. Um, and cho choosing a 16 by 9 ratio there just to emphasize that height even more. Square crops for intimate moments and for Instagram. Of course, we all love a good square crop. So here we go, getting in nice and tight, balanced. So you've got the ears kind of pointing out to the right-hand side of the frame, nice clean background. Cropping in nice and tight where you've got these beautiful eyes locked in with you. This one works quite nicely because you've got the, um, the leading line of the tree coming in from the top right-hand side of the frame down towards the bottom left of frame. Tight, intimate portraits, square crops. So when you crop with a nice tight square, you don't give the viewer any space to move outside of that frame. They are locked in. It's a very intense moment. You've just got eyes and spots and a subtle vignette around that just darkens the frame a little bit and makes sure that you really focus in on your subject. Again, simplifying patterns and stripes, going in nice and tight, very clean and getting in really tight for these kind of square crops. 
cropping for ideal compositions. So this is a, a great example. And what I want to kind of chat through here is that the way that you crop an image has a big impact on the overall story. So this is a, a great shot of a fish eagle in flight. However, there's a couple of things wrong with it. For me, there's so much space at the top of the frame that we've actually lost the sense that this eagle is taking flight. Um, for all we know, it could be a couple of meters above the river. And what we're wanting to tell in the story that we're wanting to convey in these kind of scenes is that this bird is in flight. Um, placing the subject slap bang in the middle here, you know, it, it's okay, but it kind of, there's a bit of tension in the whole story. And the third example here for me, this is the one that I would go for. And just the placement in the frame changes the story somewhat. So you'll see we've got a lot of space beneath the fish eagle, which means that we're kind of looking up, it is flying, it is elevated, it is in the sky. And then positioning the subject slightly off to the right on a PowerPoint when it comes to the rule of thirds and giving it space to move into on the left hand side of the frame just makes for a more interesting and compelling image in my view. This example over here, and this is something that a lot of people struggle with, is where do you crop subjects um, when it comes to you know, having heads, shoulders, legs, all of these weird kind of crops that you have to get, especially if you're shooting with a prime lens where you don't have a hell of a lot of wiggle room to try and correct that. And the guideline is usually to use a major joint. So behind a shoulder, behind a leg and a knee, and try and use those major joints as a guideline as to where to crop. And so if we come back to this example over here, you'll see the image on the left is the original file that we have. And then the second one is the the crop that we've made. And you could see exactly where I've placed my cropping line. I've taken away the, the kind of divots underneath the chest here, which are potentially distracting elements, and locked in on the shoulder. Have a look at where we've cropped there on that shoulder. And it's amazing to think about how a crop, a small crop like this, can change the overall look and feel of an image and also just make the story more powerful. And that's really what we're gonna to get to. I want to spend the majority of the time on today's webinar looking at how to go about it and we're gonna run through some practical examples together. Here's another example, and, and this was a particularly difficult uh, scene to photograph. Um, this was in the Tindavati. And with dogs moving, anyone who's photographed wild dogs will know that <laughs> they're always on the move. Now, when they're interacting like this, it's so difficult to keep up with them. Make sure that your focus is correct and then compose. Um, so it's very difficult. And this is the full frame. Very, very lucky to have got this dog on the left just inside the frame. Um, the issue with this framed image as it is, is we've got a lot more space on the right hand side. The majority of the movement and the energy of the frame is wild dogs running from right to left. Um, we've got that subject in on the edge there. We've got a lot more space on the right hand side. So a slightly tighter crop. Just look at the difference that we have when, in the story. I mean, just a slight adjustment like this can make such a huge difference to the overall image. And that's where cropping can really become a fine art that can help you to progress your photography to the next level. Have a look at that again. Little bit of crop in from the right hand side just to remove that, balance the space, have some equidistant kind of spacing on the edge of the tail on the right hand side and the body on the left hand side. Cropping for storytelling. This is a very interesting one and good fun and we're gonna spend a little bit more time on this, but tighter crops for more intimate and intense moments. This was an incredible scene uh, we witnessed in the Sabi Sands a number of years ago. Um, this is the full frame of the image. Very lucky to have got this. It was I was shooting off of a, I think a 400 mil at the time as well. So it didn't have much wiggle room. But watch the progression here as we move from one crop going in slightly tighter and then finally moving on to a 16 by nine crop to emphasize the width of this frame. Slightly tighter, so you'll see that we've removed the white distracting element on the right hand side, and we're going to touch on that in a bit. A little bit tighter there, and then finally, the final version is the 16 by 9 full width, full blown action. And the intention here is to get as close to the action as possible. When we have a look at that first frame, pulling back and not being as tight as we are here, it doesn't make for as intense a moment, but the moment we start to go in tighter and crop in really close, you almost feel like you're part of this fight and slap bang in the middle, which thankfully we weren't. 
tight crops for more abstract compositions. And this is something I've been working with a lot of people in private tuition over the time, is that how do you start to look and think outside of the box? Create something different. And I, I always use the analogy of we are either representing a scene, so taking a photograph of it, or we are creating our own biased interpretation of a scene. And that's what excites me. And I think a lot of people who have traveled with us are moving to that stage of their photography, which is very interesting. And um, a little later on, I think in November, I'm going to be presenting on abstract extracts from Mother Nature. And we're going to go a little bit wild and wacky on, on that one to find some interesting and unique biased interpretations. But here's a classic example of shooting with intent and having an idea of what your final image is going to look like before you've even taken it. And so for me, I shot this frame at 800 mils very close and um, a lot of people would say well why you're so close to the subject yet you're going to be shooting at 800 mils because i've got an idea in mind um looking at the pattern and texture of this male lion's mane it was just so beautiful and so the final resultant image is the the crop on the right hand side there and yeah it's quite a big crop and i probably should have shot this in landscape orientation but at the time i thought the shot was going to be in portrait orientation um and how much should you crop in in terms of the pixels that are left well, you know, if you cycle through your info um, tab on Lightroom, you'll get a very good idea of how many pixels you have. How many do you need? Well, where is it going? What is the purpose? Is it going onto Instagram, in which case you can crop to your heart's content? Or is this going onto something to be printed, which in that case, you're going to need a lot more pixels. Here's another example of cropping. Um, you can see the full frame image here, a little bit of distracting elements around the leaves. But the final story, just simplifying and making a little bit more interesting, um, focusing in on those patterns and texture of the leaves. This is from Odzala and one of my favorite images from there as well. So dealing with potentially distracting elements. Now, this is where I must confess that personally, I would far rather crop out a distracting element than spend time using the clone tool, taking into Photoshop and using content to wear full and those sort of things. I am quite conservative with my editing and I like to spend as little time on images as possible. So cropping to remove a distracting element is one of the easiest ways that you can go about actually making your images a lot stronger. And when you go through a process on, and you really think about it, you'll actually start to pick up a number of potentially distracting elements. Now, as we know, we are drawn to the sharpest, brightest, and most contrasty areas within a frame. So it stands to reason that any of the distracting elements that you can't crop out can be dealt with or dialed down by darkening them, softening them, and reducing contrast on them. However, some of them are just so big that it's much easier just to crop them out of the image altogether. So we're going to look at some examples of that as we go through this next section. Eye mapping. This is the big one for me. Now, as I go through these next couple of slides, I want you guys to pay attention to where your eyes drift um, as I progress from one slide to the next. That will give you an idea of what I'm talking about here. Potentially distracting element. I think I know where everyone is looking at the moment. What about now? Well, we're bouncing around and it's quite distracting. Mm, not quite sure where to kind of rest. Even something small like that on the edge of the frame can pull my eye. And wow, now things are all very busy. So hopefully you can kind of get where I'm going with this, guys. We've got to look for those distracting elements and we've got to think about where your eye is moving across an image. And the best example of this was an image and a, a kind of advert that uh, Canon did a while back for a printer where they took a very well-known photographer, Joel Grimes, and they put up an image of his and this, they displayed it to three categories of people and asked them to watch it. And what they did was they tracked the eye movement across the scene. So if we have a look in this section over here, you can see the non-photographer, 212 eye movements, and the photography student, 445, and the pro photographer, 1,200 almost. Now, I want you guys to consider yourselves that pro photographer side. Now, these red patches, these are essentially the overlays and the eye movement when people were viewing this image of this man. And you can see where you kind of concentrate and spend a lot more time. A couple of things that come out of this. Number one, the way that your eye moves across a frame and are in a scene. If you're all over the place, you probably don't have a very strong story. So you've got to have a good, strong anchor. You want your viewer to rest on a point of interest in the frame. 
and potentially distracting elements will pull the viewer's eye away from that story. So your editing and everything needs to be aligned with dialing up the story and, dis and dialing back distracting elements. Now, we're not going to look at the editing side of that for now, but I want you to use this process when it comes to cropping as well. The second lesson that one can take from this is that Pro photographers are very analytical. And I think from our own work, we become quite critical of our own work. We tend to spend a lot more time looking at things. So every now and again, it's a good idea to take a step back, close your eyes, open them, and watch where your eye goes through an image. When you can do that, and you will very quickly find yourself finding the distracting elements. So let's use this as an example. This is a, an image from the Maasai Mara, and we can see wildebeest dropping down into the river. And it may seem like a great image, but there are some potentially distracting elements. And a simple crop can change or dial up and intensify the story and the whole scene. Simple, just removing two potentially distracting elements which if you map your eye movement across the frame here, you're probably going to find in this left-hand frame that you are drawn to these areas. Whereas on the right-hand side, now that we've cropped those out, we are locked on to the point of greatest contrast and the sharpest area, which is now this falling wildebeest. And there's very little competing for that attention. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to quickly take a break away from my presentation and see what's going on in the chat and the comments. Hopefully, you guys are all kind of with me still. Can you give me a quick thumbs up? Don't forget that we do have a Q&A session. So as we're going through this whole presentation, any questions that you guys have, please load them into the Q&A section, and I'll get back to them and respond to all of them um, right at the end of the webinar. So thumbs up, everyone's still with me, fantastic. Um, any immediate questions that you guys would like me to kind of get going so long, please do let me know. And I'm so glad that we've been able to sort out that little technical glitch. Um, all right, seems like we are all going well. And I am then going to jump right back into the next phase of this webinar. And that is going to be with us now starting to look at some Lightroom examples. So I am, if there's no other questions, Nicole, I'm so sorry, you seem to be having some issues with um, audio, which is bizarre and video seems to be a bit blurry. I'm hoping that it's your connection and not mine and that everyone else is, is doing all right um, when it comes to that. So what I'm going to do now is let's jump into the Lightroom. I'm going to minimize this quickly, right. So I've got some examples of images here and uh, that we're going to run through. The first one here was that leopard example. And as I'm saying this, I'm kind of pointing out this section over here. You can see that little window just by removing that. And we pull down. We've now removed this little window down at the bottom. And we now have a far more uniform image. So from an eye mapping perspective, if you go back to the original and you close your eyes, and open them, yes, leopard, sharpest, greatest point of contrast in the frame, lovely texture, but I find myself bouncing then into these three places. Whereas as soon as we take this crop and we cut that out, it becomes a far more interesting and compelling image. Something like this, now this was an incredible scene that I photographed in the Okavango Delta, and I'm going to show you just how simple um, it is to remove distracting elements when you're cropping and just how it can change and enhance the story. I'm going to point out a couple of things in this image, which I'm just going to zoom in to show you because I'm hoping that it translates on your screens as well. So eye mapping, do, you, do me a favor. Bear with me for a second here. Close your eyes and open them. Tell me where you go in this image. Now it's already been edited. I would imagine that you're kind of resting over here. But some of you may be bouncing up to this little white patch over there, an egret. There's another white patch over there. And there's another white patch over there. Do me a favor, close your eyes and open them again. And now that I've pointed out those white patches, I dare you not to look at them. You can tell me if I'm wrong on this and please leave some comments in the, the Q&A section for me. But the smallest little point of contrast, especially if it's on the edge of the frame, will draw your eye. So a very easy crop on this. 
we first thing let's take out that cattle egret in the top there we've still got this one over here yes we could use a spot removal tool but this is quite an intense moment as well so let's remove that egret out of there now what's happened is we've kind of got a far more uniform scene so now we're going to crop in a little bit what i'm seeing here is this little window um, of grass in the back there and if i can present a more unified kind of background with all of these buffalo it's going to tell the story that there were a lot more buffalo whereas if there are gaps in the herd in the background it becomes less intense so what we're going to do something along these lines just on the edge of the horns of this one and we crop into there and look at that a far more compelling story because now it feels like there's an army of buffalo we don't have any white patches which are pulling our eye away from our subject another great image from the sabi sands i shared this on instagram a couple of days ago but if you have a look at some dis potentially distracting elements with this branch up on the top here we've got a backside of another line here which because it's a silhouette and because it's actually on the um, horizon there and it's not actually clearly exposed is a bit of a problem um, i opted for a a portrait crop on this just to emphasize that beautiful sky and the colors a slight tweak and just to make things straight and somewhere along these lines make the sky the most interesting and dominant part of an image like this and for me that's a much simpler cleaner image than beforehand where we had a, quite a few distracting elements this is an interesting case study so this is in the Salu a little earlier this year and a really cool image and I love the way it comes together but I'm not sure how important the sky is in this frame we've got distracting elements in the form of these branches down at the bottom over here and grasses over here we're standing on an embankment looking down and so my thinking is one of two things the first one here is to remove those distracting elements lovely hippo paths coming in looking at that horizon line maybe just straighten that up a little bit somewhere along those lines let's have a look here and voila we've removed some of our distracting elements however for me in this particular image i don't see that sky playing much of a role so if it's not adding to the story and whilst it may from one perspective add a sense of scale to this if it's not adding to the story let's remove it and see what we get so again open up my crop tool we're now starting to think more along the lines of a let's go for a square crop on this and see what we're left with okay so we're going to eliminate the sky which is going to give us a feeling that this forest extends into eternity we've got some of the hippo paths coming down here and so a square crop on something like that can you guys see how an image is changed simply by doing an edit on the crop both the aspect ratio but also just removing some of the distracting elements the story here is now just so much stronger that we're not fighting for space and we're not being pulled away from those hippo by the clouds in the background this is a another great example uh, of an image um, where we can simplify and through cropping this is an aerial shot from the Okavango Delta and through cropping we can start to look at removing some of the distracting elements photographing from the air is very difficult in that you can't change position slightly you don't have a lot of time to recompose and get that ideal composition so I always advise guests to shoot a little bit wider than what they would normally knowing full well that they can then crop into their ideal um, composition a little bit later so if we take that example on here and we open up the crop tool let's keep our original ratio for now i'm looking at distracting elements so we've got a fairly uniform kind of environment here with a little bit of grasses over over this side but then grasses on the edge of the frame here are pulling my eye away so let's take out the ones in the top right let's take away these ones on the left here now we're left with something a little bit more interesting we could maybe go in a little bit tighter we could also then look at where these leading lines run to so we could have them running out of the the bottom left of the frame across to the top right but again just a far more interesting and compelling story once we've removed those potentially distracting elements another example here so close your eyes and open them right well we've got contrast on the edge of the frame here we've got contrast on the edge of this frame here and then all of this 
kind of dirty water edge stuff taking place on the bottom left. So if we were to go and do a crop on this, we maintain our current aspect ratio because we want to preserve as many of the pixels as possible. We probably look at something like this, having this path come in from the top left, down and around, maybe just straightening this up just a touch, um, entering the leading line from the top left hand side of the frame and something like that. A far more uniform environment and if you close your eyes and open you have to go to the point of contrast which is where these elephants are and where this island is. We don't have those patches competing for our attention on the top right and bottom right hand side of the frame. Another classic example and again shooting with intent. This was the whole idea was to end up with an image that was full frame giraffe and oxpecker. Now obviously you can't get that 100% right in field but again just a subtle crop bringing this in maybe in from this left hand side as well because we've got a bit of a highlight where the light was hitting on the top right hand side of the frame up here and this on the edge here is also pulling my, my eye away so by cropping in from this side not only are we dealing with those two areas but we're now placing our subject more on the power point on this intersection over here than we had before looking at where all of these patterns and lines are exiting the frame maybe moving this up slightly so that we've got this leading line that runs down into the bottom right hand side of the frame. I hope you guys can see that. There's the final image. Can you see the common theme here? Is it shooting with intent? We've identified the story in the field, we've taken the image and then we've come in to polish it off with that bit of the crop. We're not looking at an image saying, hmm, what can I do with this shot? There's a big difference here guys. So I'd like to encourage you to shoot with intent as much as you can when you're out in the field. Another example, shooting with intent, works well as it is, but if you close your eyes and open and you do your eye mapping, yes, you come here, sharp, bright, contrast, but then there's this little patch of window up on the top left there. Again, a simple crop, not necessarily onto the edge there, keeping the main in. If we can have a more uniform area along here, dominating the frame, it's just gonna become an even more powerful image. So we go to something like this, and as we finish the crop, I'm exploring the edges of the frame to look for any signs of anything that is high in contrast that could compete with this part, which is where I want my viewer to be, is on my subject. I don't want them drifting off onto the edges of the frame. This is another great example um, from an eye mapping perspective. If you close your eyes and open again, you're going to go to these zebras drinking, high contrast. However, zebras up on the top here and on the left are contrast so you might gravitate towards these zebras here but now you're bouncing up there there's a white rump over here and then there's some zebras up on the top so if we look to crop and i know one of the questions was how do you deal with multiple subjects in a frame well let's just see how it goes first point of call let's address these two zebras up on the top left hand side of the frame we still have this backside of this zebra coming in on the left there and if you weren't sure about just how much contrast on the edge of the frame can pull your eye. Have a look at that. Look at how that tail and rump stands out. So we need to come in a little bit tighter. Looking now from a storytelling perspective, if I want to kind of enhance the feeling that there are a lot more wildebeest here than there actually are, I need to kind of fill the frame with as much of those animals as possible. So let's have a look at how I'm going to do that. Looking at this top right window over here, I'm going to bring in this crop a little bit more. And in fact, I'm actually going to opt for a 16 by 9 here. So watch what will happen as I change the aspect ratio. And I can open this up a little bit. We're filling the frame with wildebeest in the background. We've got this rump coming in over here. You see that one feels a little bit awkward. I don't have too much space before I start to lose the nose of this one over here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to exclude that rump. And something along those lines is the final image. And you can see we've shown the story of both the number of wildebeest that are here. We've got high contrast with the zebras, so we're anchored around this point, and then we're free to explore, but we always come back to this area without the distractions on the top and on the left-hand side of the frame. This is another great example. Um, and the thing with the migration is that people often think about grabbing a wide angle lens to show the volume and the number of animals in an area. But it's actually the tighter you get, the easier it is to convey that sense. And when they're massing like this, in this case, you wanna try and fill that frame. Because if I leave pockets and windows of um, 
a grass and sandbank there, it kind of takes away from the feeling that there were wall-to-wall um, zebra and wildebeest at the crossing point. So have a look at how we're going to do this one. Again, open up the crop tool. Let's deal with this grass, this patch of mud, and this section over here, which at the moment pulls away from my story of thousands of wildebeest. So we can do that very quickly, very easily there. Um, I'm looking around. Now, where do I decide to crop? In an instance like this, I don't really have any one individual that's turned and looked at me and that is anchoring the frame. So that's not much of a concern. And a great little trick for kind of then just adding a little something extra to this and just keeping the viewer engaged in the center of the frame is to use a subtle vignette. So I'm going to go into the effects panel. I'm going to apply a vignette and it's going to kind of run into the center of the frame. Look at the difference there. Very subtle but it just means that you're able to kind of rest. Your eye will rest in the center of this frame. You're free to explore the rest of the frame, but it comes to rest in the center of the frame because it's a little bit lighter than the surrounding areas. Another example from Toby. Now, this bright light in the background is potentially distracting, so my eye is drawn here and my eye is drawn over here, and really I want you to be focused on this and on the drip of water that's kind of running down this elephant's mouth here. So let's crop in, let's remove that distracting element up at the top. We've removed the one on the top left and the one in the top right. Now we've got a little bit of leg in here. So let's have a look at our options. If we crop like this, that leg becomes a distraction. Um, we've also got that window of that leg and the elephant in the back there. So let's see what happens then if we start to include that leg as a bit of a frame and we then introduce a little window of light there. So let's remove that. We've now got a more interesting story. We've got the leg running through here, and potentially that would be a pretty good crop. We could also look to go in slightly more and finish with a darker edge. You'll see the change that I've made here is because of this patch at the back of the elephant in the background and finishing with a darker frame on the edge there. I'm tending to go towards the, the kind of the wider scene, maximizing the amount of pixels overall and kind of settling on something along these lines. So you can see how we've dealt with the potentially distracting elements up towards the top of the frame and up on the top left hand side there on that one. Here's another example um, also from Chobi, beautiful dust coming down from the subject and really this is what is the key in the story here is patterns and textures and again biased interpretations. So from a storytelling perspective, cropping to tell and emphasize that story of height and the changes here, we are going to change the dimensions and we're going to go into a vertical crop. This little window of light underneath the elephant over here we need to address because if we crop to that, your eye is immediately drawn to that little window. So let's go in and literally on the edge of that fold, something along those lines. Now, the majority of the dust is falling in this section here. So this really isn't adding too much on the left here to my story. So let's go for a ratio of 16 by nine and see if we can't just further enhance that story. I'm not gonna go all the way here because look, if I do that, the ear becomes a potentially distracting element. So I'm gonna bring that back in onto the edge just a little bit and I'm probably going to settle with something along those lines. Again, a very abstract image and not your normal kind of storytelling image, but it certainly is an elephant and it leads a little to the imagination, which is quite cool. We've had a look at this image um, a little earlier on, so we're going to kind of move past this. Great example here. So this is full frame, 800 mils line right next door to the vehicle. And this window in the top right here, although there's no real detail there, it's quite soft, there's no real and pull away from the subject there, it really can help us if we can just deal with it a little bit and reduce it in size. So just straightening the image a little bit and then coming into it further enhance, just reduce that background section. Look at where the eye sits in terms of the rule of thirds, right on that PowerPoint there. And that is a final image, just dialing down that window in the back right hand side of the frame. 
again, shooting with intent. I had the idea of the shot before I executed it. And then from a cropping perspective, I was able to kind of polish it off a little bit alongside the editing, which has also been done to kind of push your eye towards the eye of the line. Full frame shot, animal in environment, which is what Marlon and I will be chatting about on Friday. The only real thing here is from an eye mapping perspective is I'm drawn this little raffia palm over here and palm over here. Those are potentially distracting elements and because they're right on the edge of the frame, I'm just gonna show you guys that piece there and this piece there. Now I could use a spot removal tool. I could go into Photoshop, but hey, why when I can just kind of crop it out to this point, something along those lines. It's a small example, a minor adjustment, um, but makes a big difference. This example is a good one for us to chat about when it comes to actually um, cropping a subject in terms of the body. Um, potentially distracting elements here, yes, we've got this branch that runs across and it's a potentially distracting element, not because it's sharp, but because it is um, contrast on the main. This window of light in the background here is also a potentially distracting element, this section up here on the top right hand side of the frame. We've also got another male line resting down here on the bottom left. So those for me are the potentially distracting elements. So let's have a look at from a crop, how we can address those. Look to remove that mane. Luckily it sits just behind his shoulder before the mane there. And by cropping in there, we've actually reduced and taken away this bright patch of light in the top right hand corner. And we have a more interesting image. So if we'd gone any tighter on here, uh, it starts to look a little bit funny. Uh, somewhere around there. We don't want to crop off that main. So main shoulder joint just over there, even though he's lying at a slight angle, that's pretty much where we want to settle on that front. Another great example here. So I knew the shot that I wanted. I wanted the shadow reflecting in the background. Potentially distracting elements here. If you do your eye mapping, close your eyes open, bang onto the little guy, contrast in the nose against the shadow. You go to the shadow, bright patch in the top right hand corner. And potentially this little piece of wood down on the bottom right here, which is on the edge of the frame and therefore point of contrast. And I dare you to unsee it now that I've pointed it out. If we then take a crop, no funny business at all. Just looking at the where the, the, the shadow from a tree is falling. We've got a, that's something along those lines. Well, now we've kind of too close to his rump. We've got this little patch coming in on the bottom right hand corner. So let's adjust that slightly. We take this in to remove that dark patch there. And we've given ourselves a little bit more space on the rump and got more shadow. And look at where the face now sits in terms of the rule of thirds. Bang on to that PowerPoint. Very clean and simple. Eye mapping, close your eyes and open. There's no more window of light up in the top right hand side of that frame for you to go to. Take away things that are pulling your viewer eye away from your subject. If there's one thing that you take away from this webinar tonight, it's eye mapping, guys. Close your eyes, open them, trace, look at where your eye goes, look at where it's kind of resting more than, than not, and find those potentially distracting elements. Right, I think that is it from the Lightroom side of things. So I'm gonna bring this in quickly and kind of do a, a bit of a final check here. So if you were to take home a couple of pointers from this, hopefully this will be the part that's really gonna change things for you. Think before you crop. Questions to ask yourself. Is there an aspect ratio that will complement my story? Remember, 16 by nine, emphasizing width. Portrait orientation 16 by 9, emphasizing height, square crops, which will um, kind of emphasize uh, a more intimate and, and expressive moments. Is there a story that will be enhanced through my cropping? So does getting in tighter dis d pull away from the story? Does getting in tighter make it easier for my viewer to understand what it is that I'm trying to get across? Do I need to consider the correct places to crop my subject? So don't cut halfway through a joint. If you're gonna keep a leg in, keep the whole leg in. And if you're going to cut behind a joint, make sure that it's right behind the joint. Think about the shoulder joint of a lioness that's walking from left to right. And you now crop it just behind her back legs, but the 
body now all of a sudden looks a whole lot longer than what it's kind of intended for. So the last thing you want to do is have a lioness that's going to look like a stretch limo because you've now decided to crop in front of the back legs when you should be cropping behind the shoulder blades. Right. Are there distracting elements that can be removed through cropping? And I would like to encourage you guys to do this rather than using the spot removal tool to remove massive amounts of content. And even more than that, I would encourage you to try and crop and get it right in camera so that you don't have to spend too much time editing and trying to remove all of these potentially distracting elements from the frame. Recipe, crop, check, map, repeat. And it's very simple. Make your crop, check the edges of the frame, close your eyes, open, do your eye mapping. If there's something on the edge of the frame that pulls your eye, you have to readjust and then go through that whole process again. And I promise you, you will find the smallest little points of contrast on the edge of the frame, pulling your eye away and detracting from the overall story. And this is where the fine art of, crop of cropping really comes in, is once you've seen those little distracting elements, you will not be able to unsee them. I hope you guys have enjoyed this. I'm going to now kind of go through into the Q&A session. Um, so if you have any questions, if you haven't already loaded them in there, please go ahead and drop them in. Any comments and feedback would be most appreciated. I'm um, gonna open up the chat here first. Uh, Marlon here, everyone's visual quality. Eye mapping, love this technique. Thanks, Silke. Um, Marlon, seems like you've got the cold shoulder, but thank you very much for helping me out with the technical side of things. Um, Tim Allen asking, if you inadvertently chopped off part of the subject's tail or lower limb, would you crop more rigorously so that your mistake is less evident in the final image? So I think the best way to put this, Tim, is you've got to make sure that if you've cropped something, that it looks intentional. There is nothing worse and funny enough, nothing more obvious than if it is a mistake. So yes, if you've clipped the tail, that tail's got to go. Um, if you've clipped the limb or a foot on the limb, it's got to go. And this becomes especially challenging when you're shooting with a prime lens because you don't have the luxury of being able to pull back or try something a little bit different um, in terms of your focal length. So what I can say, again, paying attention. Remember that first slide where we said the best time to crop an image is before you actually trip the shutter? If you can pick these sort of things up in the field, and let's say you're shooting with a prime lens with a fixed focal length, and you notice that the, the ear, the top right of the ear is out of the frame. Take the shot, take a second shot and merge them in Lightroom. You can save and pull those images together. And I've done this so many times intentionally, but also when I haven't been able to pull a subject into the frame completely, is to make sure that I keep those parts of the body that would have been cropped in a second frame, which can then be merged. So it comes down to your editing in the field and paying attention to your composition in the field as much as anything else. For fine printing, would you choose 16 by nine size? So Ricardo, it's a, it's a good question. And cropping for printing is, is something that's quite interesting because it, you're cropping for a purpose. So if someone says to me, oh, I'd love a fine art image, um, what, which one should I get and how big should I print it? Well, what are the dimensions? Where is it going to be displayed? Um, you know, if you think about an image that you would want maybe over your main bedroom, it's probably going to be a wider image than it is a taller image. So it might be two meters by one meter, for example. Now, not all images will work with that kind of a ratio. So you've got to crop an image to two by one to make sure that it's going to work in that space. So before you go and print, find out the frame and the, the dimension. Where is this image going to sit in your living room, in your lounge, in your space, in a dining area? Um, you know, are you thinking of putting together a triptych where you're going to have three square images or three panels in portrait orientation? So it's not as simple as saying, yeah, I'd love to have that printed. Can you send it to me at two by one? Well, not all images are like that. And as we've seen, the way that you crop an image can have an impact on the story. So if I've got a nice, tight, intimate portrait, which you say, oh, that's fantastic. You see it as a one by one square crop. And you think that's incredible, I'd love a print of that, but I need it for my living room and I need it in a five by four, the whole story of the image might change. It might fall flat because you're changing the aspect ratio. So you have to crop and you have to almost identify a space of where that print is going to go or how it's going to sit in a frame 
before you actually go and select an image and print it. Um, and that's a very important question to, to have asked, and I, I hope um, that what I've, uh, the way I've explained that makes sense. Um, are there any other questions uh, coming through? I haven't seen anything else. No questions, Mandeep, you really enjoyed it. Love the four-stage mantra, I appreciate that. Um, great stuff to think about and practice, David. My absolute pleasure. Eye mapping is golden. It really is cool. There, there used to be a video um, associated with that uh, exercise that Canon did with Joel Grimes. And it was really cool to see how people moved across a frame. But just in your own photography, think about that. Just once you've edited an image, close your eyes, open and see where you go. Don't forget to use things like vignettes and brushes to dial down particular aspects of a frame that pull your eye away from where your story is. And then use things like contrast, exposure and clarity to dial up parts of the frame that you want your viewer to rest um, on. So if you can't crop it out, use the tools that you have available to dial those things back a little bit. Um, great, fantastic. Guys, I again apologize for the slight glitch, but hopefully um, this has the quality of the presentation has made up for it. And we're going to be re recording these and we'll be putting them onto our YouTube channel. I know that there are a number of regulars on here who've been supporting the WildEye team over the last couple of months, and we really value your um, support and time in joining us with these webinars. There's still loads more coming down the pipeline. As you can see, we are gearing up to bring you even better quality in terms of presentations and content um, from the WildEye Studio. And um, I'm really grateful and thankful for all of you that have supported us the way that you have over the coming or over the past months. Uh, changes on the horizon, both from a travel perspective and from our company perspective, but it's all good, I can assure you that. Thank you so much. If you guys have any other questions, you will get a mail coming from me tomorrow just thanking you for joining me. Please hit me up um, with any direct questions or examples or um, issues that you may have. And um, yeah, thank you so much for joining me and we will catch you guys in the new week. Cheers.